Welcome again, everyone, to the Online Soapbox Church. Uh, great to meet again around God's Word today. And so today we're going to discuss the contradictions that appear to be in the Bible. They are the target of the skeptic. So, John, if the Bible contradicts itself, then it is evidence that the Bible is not God's Word when written by man. Yeah, it's pretty fundamental, um, really, if the Bible does contradict then it's not God's word because if God wrote the whole Bible, then it's going to be one and the same, isn't it? God, God's not the author of confusion. And scripture does claim in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired of God. And at the end of the day, if we're Christians and our manual, our, our foundational document is the Bible, then it contradicts showing it's been written by man, then you know, I don't want a bar of that. It's unreliable. So, so it is pretty fundamental. Now, from my point of view, I got converted on the back of um, evidence, uh, apologetics, showing that the Bible was the Word of God. And I know there are some Christians who, who don't need that, who didn't come to the Lord because of that. No problem with that. But we do have examples in Scripture, for example, where the Apostle Paul sometimes would spend years in place, hiring a place, and it said he would reason with the Jews in particular in his day, showing them that Jesus was the Christ. And of course, in doing so, he'd be going through the Old Testament scriptures, prophesied Christ, you know, going through that apologetic thing, showing them that Jesus was the Lord. So, you know, there's definitely a place for understanding, confirming the Bible is the word of God. And for some of us, um, we need that evidence before we're going to embrace the Savior. Now, the amazing thing about the Bible it's written by over 40 authors, obviously inspired by God, but 40 different authors over a period of about 1,600 years, and yet doesn't contradict. That, that's, that's the way I see it. Now, I've spent many years looking at quite a few of the, the contradictions, being um, asked by people, what about this contradiction and that contradiction? And there's always an answer. And, and to be honest, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of apparent or alleged contradictions in the Bible. And we talk, we'll talk about a few of them shortly, just as examples. But every time there is an explanation when you look in Scripture explaining why it would be the case. So we'll do a little bit of that today. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, if the Bible was, in fact, God's inspired word, like 100%, then why would God allow for the confusion of alleged contradictions? Mm. Again, it's a good question because if God wants us to believe the Bible, why let it be that there appears to be contradictions? Well, there's, there's several answers to that. Firstly, Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, it's the glory of God to conceal mm. and it's the honour of kings to search it out. So God actually deliberately conceals things so that we can search. Um, even, even good teachers, you know, school teachers know this principle because it's a lot better if their students can search for something rather than just getting it all laid out. Um, it can also be a test. Um, sometimes God deliberately presents himself as a God that doesn't make sense. You know, those of you who have been Christians for a few years will have had tests and trials in your life where it appeared God wasn't with you. It appeared God was taking you through something tougher than you could handle. And yet you've come through and you've learned, actually, God really was with me. And God has deliberately done that just to test you, to take you deeper and to show that actually he was there. But you see, test a test isn't a test of trust until, you know, it, it really gets tough. Um you know, there's a, a classic example of this with Abraham when God asked Abraham to offer up his son as a, as a sacrifice. Now, God hates human sacrifice. So why would God ask Abraham to offer his son? Add to that the fact that God had promised Abraham that through his son Isaac, promises would be fulfilled of, of him having a multitude and a seed. So if Abraham kills Isaac, the promise can't be fulfilled. So on the surface, it's a request by God that doesn't make sense. God was working in it to test Abraham's obedience. Abraham was prepared to be obedient. 
Um, God obviously stayed his hand. He didn't kill Isaac. But God, God was testing Abraham um, along those lines. Jesus as well did a lot of his teaching in parables. And parables, just in simple um, definition, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But often the parables didn't have uh, an on-the-surface clear meaning. And even the disciples had to say to Jesus, listen, we don't understand what you were saying. And why would Jesus then teach in a way that concealed things? Well, firstly, to protect his teaching from those who would just use it against him. They'd listen and go, oh, what's he on about? He's a nutter. And just leave him alone, like the Pharisees. And B, to make his disciples think and ask, Jesus, can you explain you know, what you were talking about? And we all know as well in learning things, often a picture paints a thousand words. So often Jesus was painting a picture in his parables. He'd talk about, you know, a sower that went out to sow. Yeah. And he goes and sows seeds. So you've got this, this picture of, of a pastoral scene, horticultural scenes. There were fig trees. There were sheep and goats, etc. Mm-hmm. in Jesus' parables. And they paint a picture which often sticks in your mind. So those are some of the reasons why God deliberately hears to let there be contradictions in the Bible. Mm. So, John, can you take us through some of the general principles and reasons for apparent contradictions before we start looking, you know, at specific examples in detail? Yep, we'll do that. Uh, What I'm going to do is just share with you uh, a short PowerPoint that I've prepared along these lines. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, Alleged contradictions of the Bible. Maybe just a thumbs up, guy. Thank you. So that's come through. So... I've got a picture here of the Bible um, as a positive and a negative, m- much like you'd see in a, in a photograph. And, you know, you can go to a court of law where you would think a law is a law, it's black and it's white, right? But in reality, if you've ever been in a court case, Guy would know about this, being an ex-policeman, you will get lawyers arguing, you know, 100% mm. black. This guy's guilty. This is the evidence. And if you're on the jury, you'll hear this and go, oh, yeah, he's definitely guilty. Then you'll get the defense lawyer come on board who argues, no, white, he's innocent. We'll give all the evidence for his innocence. And now you're on the jury, you've heard this, you go, yeah, he's innocent. And this is how often in court cases you get hung juries Mm -hmm. or you get juries that take days to deliberate because the arguments on both sides are just as good. So... You know, you can see the Bible black, you can see it contradicting, or you can see it white. You can see, no, nah, this is the word of God. It really, really depends, because obviously in a court of law, there is a truth. The, the guy's either guilty or is innocent. Both both lawyers aren't right. But the way you present the evidence, maybe there's, there's deceptive stuff comes in. So often it's the way you see things. Now, the reality is, I found most people who criticize the Bible and come up with all these contradictions. They've never read the Bible. Um, they're not really objective. They're just looking for an excuse why they don't need to admit they're owned mm-hmm. by the author of the Bible. Whereas we've read the Bible, you know, many, many times, cover to cover, and, and we've studied it in detail. Now, the reality is the truth of God's word, God himself, he's, he's got no fear about coming under scrutiny. You can search the word of God, look at the evidence in the word of God, and you will find that actually it all hangs together. There is no problem. Now, I bought a book, and I've got it on the screen there for you. It's called Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible. I bought this book way back in the dark ages, sort of early 80s, when I first got converted. And it literally has thousands of different alleged discrepancies, you know, from numbers of this in one place to a different number somewhere else etc etc and it goes through every scripture explaining generally a number of possible explanations showing that actually they're not discrepancies at all looked online today that book is still available online uh 20 to 30 dollars is probably what you'd expect to pay for it so i would encourage if you don't have a bible bookshop in your area maybe go online buy it online well worth having in your arsenal for your Bible studies because if someone ever questions you, what about this scripture, or you're reading a scripture yourself and it appears 
to not make sense, um, that book will help you help you explain that. Now, as I say, there's a myriad, there's thousands of alleged discrepancies that are often just the imagination of the critic. The reality, the reality is most people are prejudiced. Uh, if you don't want to believe the Bible, you're going to find any reason you can to not believe it. And the interesting thing is that this whole criticism, like they called it higher criticism in the 19th century. It's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Because it set out to undermine the Bible. Um, interesting that it, it comes at the same time as Darwin, Darwin mm. and brought the theory of, of evolution, showing that actually we're not made by God. We, ju we just evolved, which, of course, isn't scientific either. So these, these ideas coincide. Theory of evolution with criticizing the Bible. So we've already discussed today why um, the discrepancies were permitted to exist by God if actually they don't exist. We've, we've just discussed that. You know, God is actually testing us. We've looked at Proverbs 25 verse 2. Got that on the screen there for you. And the reality is, as Peter also says, some things are hard to understand. God's deliberately made it that way so that if someone is prejudiced, they can rest them, they can twist them. Yeah. But if you really want to know and you delve into his word, God will reveal those things to you. Now, as I said, Jesus often spoke in parables. God conceals things. And there's a scripture in Matthew 7, verse 7, that says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. Now, isn't that interesting that that scripture is there? Why doesn't God just say, I'll give you, I'll find you, I'll open? There's a prerequisite here. Mm. God wants us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And remember, we did a talk recently about pressing into God. And we talked about, you know, sometimes we miss out on what God has because we simply don't ask. Mm. Okay? So having these so-called alleged discrepancies that we need to do a bit of digging on, we need to ask about, you know, they will have a much more lasting impression if we actually have to do uh, a bit of digging. Matthew 13, verse 13, this is Jesus saying, you know, I speak to them in parables because seeing they don't see, hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. So he had a lot of people just wanting to undermine him, and so he deliberately spoke in parables. If they wanted to know, they could ask. So we might ask the question as well, well, why does a holy and a sinless creator even allow evil and sin to enter creation at all, let alone allowing apparent discrepancies? Well, we've got a booklet entitled Sin, Necessary Evil, because it was, in fact, through sin entering, that man gets free will, and that's what God wants. He wants people to come to him who want to from their own free will and who love him. So this is a, a principle of God as well. Now, the interesting thing about these alleged discrepancies that you find in the Bible actually proves that the Bible wasn't written by men just getting together and colluding and saying, listen, we'll make sure we all write the same thing. And again, coming back to a courtroom scenario, when you have the testimony of witnesses, should all their evidence agree precisely in every word, then, you know, judge would actually say, hang on a minute, this, <laughs> this isn't right. There's, there's something going, going wrong here. So the fact that we do have these slightly different views, not contradictions, they're just different views in the Bible, proves actually that the Bible wasn't wasn't contrived. Now there's a famous famous court case in the US in 1868 and it was a um, it was a fight over a will worth you know many millions of dollars at the time and there was an original will and there was a later will signed supposedly um, by the original person. So the court had to decide which will was the real one and it turned out, that the signature was so perfect in every stroke that it must have been, um, um, what's the word, traced. So therefore, this will with, with the traced um, signature was 
was discarded. It was, you know, proved to be false. And quite someday, you know, you'd like to think probably that your signature is pretty much the same all the time. In reality, if you were to put one over another, there's always going to be slight differences. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this signature was actually identical on every downstroke proved that it was actually a forgery. So, you know, there is this, this element as well where these alleged discrepancies actually prove that men didn't get together and contrive it. Now, we all, we've all heard of Sir Isaac Newton. Um, he's still regarded as one of the famous, if not the most famous scientist of all time, despite the fact that he lived, you know, several hundred years ago. But he said this about the scriptures. He accounted the scriptures of God to be the most sublime philosophy, more sure marks of authenticity than any profane history whatsoever. And that's that's Sir Isaac Newton, a very clever scientist. He he believed that the marks of authenticity were there in the Bible. Now, in the alleged discrepancies, there are all sorts of different variations. Um, this is one of the minor ones where David talks about striking Hadadiza, but in the Chronicles version, he struck Hadadiza. It's purely um, either an English translation or a, or a Hebrew copyist error that's made Hadadiza, Hadadiza. It doesn't change the sense, and it's obviously just a, a copyist error, and that, that's sometimes what happens. Now, here's the Hebrew alphabet. I don't speak Hebrew, um, but you can see how a lot of the letters do look quite similar. I don't know if I do this on the screen. No, I don't think the highlighter likes to be on the screen, but you might be able to see that red dot there. No. no. But let's, say, take the fourth one from the left, Dalit. See that Dalit, number four? See how similar that looks to Vav, number six, or even to Zane, number seven. Okay, slightly different size on the horizontal stroke, but they do look similar, don't they? Now, you take Kaf, number 20, and the numbers are there actually to, to show that Hebrew letters also have a numerical value. Um, and then you take the bottom right, number 400. You know, again, very similar. And in Hebrew, the, the Hebrew scribes, the translators, were extremely diligent, extremely punctilious about their copying of the scriptures. They, they took that job very seriously. But human beings are human beings. Occasionally, they would make the odd mistake. And we've picked that up over the years. It doesn't change the sense of the Bible, but it just shows you these alleged you know, errors don't change the Bible message at all. Now, a significant comparison study also was done with the scroll of Isaiah, written about 100 BC, that was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were discovered in 1947, so you know, almost 2,000 years after Christ. And they found the two texts were practically identical. The only minor differences um, didn't affect the meaning of the text whatsoever. So you've got, you know, texts, like our modern copy of Isaiah compared to one written in 100 BC, identical. So this shows you how, how good the copyists were. So similar events, are they necessarily identical when observed? And I'll give you an example. Let's say I observe a car accident. And I'll see the car accident and I'll tell the police, this car came screaming along from my left-hand side, doing 100 kilometres an hour, and it crashed into that pole, you know, right there on my right. And then they interview another witness who says, no, nah, oh, well, I saw this car coming from my right and it smashed into that pole on my left. Do those events contradict? Is one witness lying? Is one witness actually incorrect? Well, no, if you understand that the witnesses were standing on opposite side of the road. If I'm standing here, to my left, the car comes, someone's standing on the opposite side of the road looking at me, they see the car coming from their right, you see? So these are not contradictions. These are purely eyewitness accounts that describe accurately the same event, 
but not necessarily in the same way because of the angle they were standing on, for example. I've got an example here. Um, this is about Jesus healing a blind man and blind men, plural. It says, as he drew near Jericho, it happened that a certain blind man sat by the roadside begging. And hearing the crowd, he cried out, Jesus, son of, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So that's Luke 18 into Luke 19. This is an account in Matthew 20 that says, as he, and I can't see it because the, mm -hmm. the shearing's at the top of it, but I think it says, as he left Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And it says, it says there were two blind men who cried out, have mercy on us. And some of the skeptics have said, oh, well, there you go, you know. Bible contradicts. In one place it says there was one blind man, now it's saying there's two blind men. But did you notice there was a difference? And I sort of gave it away. Let's go back to that um, Luke account. It says, as he came near Jericho, whereas the Matthew one says, as he was leaving, was leaving Jericho. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. So this isn't the same event. There was a blind man that Jesus healed going in, there were two blind men that Jesus heals coming out. Now, they do use the same words, but again, that could be explained if these two blind men saw yes. first healing and then followed Jesus and saw the result of it. Mm -hmm. And then as he exits Jericho, they say, oh, we'll do the same. We, they, he got healed. Mm -hmm. We'll get healed too. So that's just one example of one of the alleged contradictions, and you can see the explanation is there quite clearly. Now, Sometimes people accuse the Bible of contradicting and the scriptures, but what we've got to realize is sometimes these apparent contradictory scriptures actually describe different timing. We've also got to remember that a text without a context is a pretext. So in other words, you can't take part of scripture out of its context and apply it to something wasn't intended for it. And if you leave it in its context, there will be an explanation. The other question sometimes we had to ask is, is this scripture symbolic or literal? Because if it's symbolic, then we talk about poetic li license. You know, when there's poetic license, when something is symbolic, you, know, you can have all sorts of imaginary beasts and creatures that the Bible uses um, to, to explain things because it's symbolic. They're not real. So they don't contradict laws of science. It's, it's just symbolic language. And that can sometimes be the, the explanation. So in scripture, sometimes differences are not contradictions, just as we saw of that example of that car accident. Now, in John 20, we saw there that there was um, two, I think it says, two angels, one at the head and the other at the feet. And yet in Mark 16, it says, entering into the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white garment, and they were afraid. In other words, one angel. So again, this is one of the contradictions, supposedly, that the skeptics bring about. Oh, you know, in the tomb, there was two angels. Someone else says it was one. Well, if you look, and we won't go into all the details now, but if you look at the timeline of those gospel records, John 20, Mark 16, although they obviously have to do with, with Jesus' resurrection, they are different times when people came at different times yeah. and saw the empty tomb. You know, the Marys came, for example, Peter and um, Peter and um, John came another time. So different times, there can be two angels one time, one angel at another time. No problem at all. We also need to consider sometimes the meaning of original words. Bear in mind, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament primarily in Greek, not in English. And in translation, sometimes there can be this contradiction. 2 Timothy 2.24, for example, says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Okay, that's pretty clear, right? But then read Luke 13.24, the teaching of Jesus, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Oh, so a skeptic's going to say, ah, oh, the Bible obviously written by different people with different ideas. It's contradicting itself. In one scripture, it says, must not strive. And in the next scripture, it says, well, strive. Okay, that, that, that's a good one. But let's go back mm. 
to the original Greek word. I've done that for you. So in 2 Timothy 2.24, when it says the servant of the Lord should not strive, it's the Greek word that means to make war, to quarrel, to have disputes. Mm. So we're not to be argumentative. We're not to be quarrelsome people is what that is saying. But it's a different Greek word in the Luke account. It's the Greek agonizomai, from which we get our English agonize. So Jesus is saying agonize, in other words, spend energy, spend yourself to enter into the kingdom. Totally different Greek words. So if we were to read those scriptures in Greek, there'd be no contradiction, there'd be no um, discrepancy, no problem at all. We've read that in English, and now all of a sudden, huh, there's an apparent contradiction. Go back to the original words, and you see there is no contradiction whatsoever. Now, I've spent, as I said earlier, many years um, particularly corresponding with people who have brought dozens and dozens of different contradictions supposedly to me, given them answers to all of them. Generally, what happens is people just bring another one, bring another one, bring another one, and then eventually they go quiet. I haven't yet had one person say, you know what? You've answered enough of the main contradictions mm -hmm. that actually huh, I can see the Bible doesn't contradict. I'm going to believe what it said. And again, it just shows you that most people have a prejudice. Yeah. They don't want to believe the Bible, so they'll pluck at any opportunity. But, you know, that book that I mentioned, I'd, I'd recommend, they're all in there. Um, pretty much any supposed um, contradiction someone could bring, it's explained in there. And it just shows you when all of these alleged discrepancies, these apparent contradictions have explanations, you've got to say to yourself, this book, the Bible, written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors, Okay, 40 different authors, and it all agrees. The message is the same. And bear in mind, the ones who wrote latterly, some was on a different continent. They didn't have actually the scroll of the previous guy to say, right, I'll make sure I don't contradict him. No, they wrote independently because they were inspired of God independently. And God inspired them with a message that fits. The word of God, it's our manual for living, mm. it's our foundation for our faith that explains to us who God is, what he requires of us, his creation, and what the future holds. There is no other religion that has that sort of kudos, that has that sort of foundational document mm. in its arsenal and that can predict the future as well at all. So true Christianity, it, it's the only religion that has any hope, that can bring forgiveness of sins, that can bring a hope for the future. So hope you've enjoyed that. Um, like I say, we could we could go on. Originally, I think this was a four-part series, and I went through a lot of different scriptures, a lot of different contradictions. But just today, we want to cover the subject just in principle, and I think you can see from those general principles that you'll actually be able to look at those, you know, apparent contradictions yourself, and you know, um, check them out for yourself. Yeah, thanks for that, John. Yeah, it's definitely helpful um, to be given the the tools, basically, of ways to approach. You know, if we if we have something that appears a contradiction um, put to us, you know, because it's important for us to want to give an answer. Um, we know the answers are there, but sometimes it's just knowing how how to approach and. Um, just thinking back, I know, Luke, you, you mentioned it at the start, um, I think in your prayer, and, and then, John, you also brought that scripture in the beginning um, from Second Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. You know, and it, it is a good one because it says all scripture is God-breathed, not, not just some, all. And I think, you know, when there are clear scriptures that you, you can't kind of interpret wrong or... You know, if there's something else that doesn't quite marry up, then that's what you've got to look at with the, those really clear cut um, scriptures. And it also reminded me of um, the famous English writer and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis. And he said that Christianity, if false, is of no importance. 
And if true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderate is moderately important. And I think that's a really good key point for us, you know, to always hold close to our heart. Like if all scripture is God breathed and it's true, then it is infinitely important and and it should be our, our life ambition to, to know it and understand it. Um because if it's not, well then the whole thing the whole thing's false and mm. we're just wasting our time. Exactly. I think it can't be as halfway. I love, I love that quote from C.S. Lewis. And of course, um, if you've ever read the Narnia Chronicles, how many of you heard of the Narnia Chronicles? They've been made into movies. You know, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe being probably the, the most famous one, I think, of the of the seven in the series. Uh, but C.S. Lewis um, mm. wrote those. So, you know, very, very famous man, and he was a Christian. And just to confirm, we use that word apologist or um, to make an apology or apologetics, as I, as I mentioned earlier. It's sort of a, it's a funny word, and it sort of makes it sound like, oh, I'm apologizing for being a Christian. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a Christian. But it actually, it comes from a, a Greek word, um, which literally means to give a defense or to give an answer for. So when we talk about apologetics or making an apology for our faith, it's, it's actually meaning that you're giving an answer. You're giving a reason from mm. that Greek from that Greek origin. And, you know, the other thing is, as some of you may have wondered, you know, we have our Bible. We believe it's all in spite of God. The Roman Catholics have extra books in their Bible. It's called the, called the Apocrypha. Um, now, in the Protestant Bible, it's not in there because basically we don't believe they are inspired books. They were written um, during periods of history that, God wasn't inspiring his word. And if you read the Apocrypha, um, yes, there are things in there that refer to God and whatever and refer to historical events like the Maccabees, etc. But there is also a lot of human superstition about spirits and demons and all this sort of stuff. So it is right and proper mm. that actually they've been left out of the inspired Bible because they don't they don't match up. They they in fact do contradict the Bible, so therefore weren't weren't inspired by God. Thanks, Lenore. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. I'll hand back to you, Luke.